Hello, welcome to the channel Why Stories. Enjoy watching. Are you going to the hospital again with a whole load of junk for Mari? How long is this going to continue? Victor angrily asked Sonora Delgado when he saw her in the kitchen. Marina had been in the hospital for six months already. After extended chemotherapy and treatment, the doctors had given her a final and very discouraging diagnosis. The tumor was growing and the disease was progressing. Since her hospitalization, neither Sonora Delgado nor Victor had known any peace. She spent all her time in the hospital, and he worked two shifts to continue paying the mortgage for the apartment they lived in. Victor, what business is it of yours what I take there? You should visit Mari more often yourself. After all, she's your wife. And you have no shame or conscience. When was the last time you saw her? Sonora Delgado snapped. Well, what's the point of going there if she's going to die anyway? Torturing myself and her along with it. Hold your tongue. By the way, I earn money so that you can buy all this nonsense that she's not allowed to eat anyway. And we keep spending, spending. We're spending again. I pay for groceries. I've been paying the mortgage for over a year now, even though the apartment belongs to Mari. I'm only registered here thanks to your kindness of heart. I already work two jobs without weekends or holidays. And you dare to reproach me for something else? It's better for you, Vico, to shut up. He's paying, the hero, he worked overtime, poor thing, Sonora Delgado said sarcastically. And in previous years, who paid for everything? You never earned good. Either you leached off Mari for a whole year, or you made ends meet with odd jobs. Shame on you. All your life, Mari earned more than you, worked hard, and never had a moment of rest. And now look at the result. And don't even mention the apartment. In all 15 years of your life together, you didn't pay the mortgage or even the utility bills once. And now you're working so hard only because you don't want to end up on the street. Your mother is not a stupid woman. She pushed you onto your wife's shoulders when she had had enough of you, you scoundrel. I don't understand what my Mari saw in you. And what you've been living on all these years, like you had a gold mine, so you should thank me and Mari. You'd be living in a one-bedroom apartment at best right now if I hadn't agreed to sell two of my rooms and give you money for the down payment. Well, as for me moving here, don't complain, those were my arrangements with Mari. I need somewhere to live too. And what about the apartment belongs to her, not to you, thank yourself. You only got married after five years of living together. And even if you had done so earlier, I still wouldn't have allowed you to get a single square meter. Don't anger me, Vico. I can still give you a piece of my mind, and I'm good for it. Well, Mari dies, and we'll see whose apartment it is. Or you think after funeral immediately I'll gather my things and disappear somewhere? You won't wait. You, dear Sonora Delgado, will go to your country house to live. I'm the legal husband, so all property is joint. And these five years we lived without the stamp, I'll easily prove in court that we were a family. Don't worry, we'll see who owes what to whom. He went to his room, quickly got dressed, and loudly closed the front door behind him. Sonora Delgado sank onto a stool near the table and cried. Lord, why did my girl have to tie her life to such a wretch? And I told her that everything was written on his face, she thought to herself. Marina met Victor back in her student years. She was never a beauty and envied those girls who had no shortage of suitors. They were invited to movies and cafes, walked home. They regularly received gifts, flowers, chocolates, perfumes, whatever the young people from simple families could afford. Many of them spent their days in pairs and worked at warehouses at night to pay for everything their girlfriends could dream of, young and not spoiled by male attention students. Marina, who was gifted with tall stature, a flat figure, and poor eyesight, could only dream of such attention. In school, boys never paid her any attention, and the most unruly ones teased her as four eyes and sparrow. She felt terribly embarrassed about herself, hated her unattractive body, and cursed the glasses she had to wear constantly. 
Sonora Delgado always noticed her daughter's complexes but never shared them. Mari, why are you so upset? Okay, some Oscar called you a bespectacled sparrow. So what now? These are just boys. They're still foolish at this age. Well, if you want, switch to contact lenses. Many girls wear them now, and boys too. Not everyone has eagle-like eyesight, Sonora Delgado reassured her daughter every time she came home from school in tears. In general, face features aren't the most important thing. What will these painted dolls achieve in life, who have been ruining their skin with tons of cheap cosmetics since they were 15, just to please that riffraff from the neighborhood? Once you grow up, mature, everything will change. But the years went by, and nothing changed. Even if you replace glasses with contact lenses, tall stature and a flat figure won't go away. Higher education and prospects in life are good, of course, but they won't replace the joy of college days, dates, moonlit kisses, joint countryside walks, and other romantic attributes that only beautiful girls can experience. These thoughts firmly settled in Marina's head since school when she experienced the full harm of ridicule because of her appearance. In college, she came with a clear understanding that she would dine alone in the cafeteria, read books during breaks in the lecture hall, and on the way home, go over in her head what she managed to memorize during lectures. Marina had long since resigned herself to this. While everyone else was having fun, skipping classes, and studying just to avoid parental scolding, she would acquire knowledge that would allow her to find a decent job in the future. When, after two years of profound student loneliness, he sat down next to her in the college cafeteria, she was very surprised. They had never crossed paths before. May I have lunch with you? The young man politely asked. Today there are so many people, all the tables are taken. And I've already got my lunch. It's uncomfortable to eat while standing. Why not? Look, there's a whole group of young people eating by the windows, and they put the food right on the windowsills, Marina chuckled. She looked at the young man and saw tension in his eyes. He took her sarcasm seriously. Marina hurried to apologize. What? I was just joking, she said with a smile. Of course, sit down, I don't mind if you join me for lunch. It turned out he was studying in a different department, so they had never crossed paths in the lecture halls. After they finished their lunch, Victor clearly didn't want to leave. Would you like a pastry? He asked. I can buy it myself if I want. Although, on the other hand, she was pleased that he offered to take care of her. No young man had ever bought her gifts, even if they were as insignificant as pastries in the college cafeteria. Victor bought pastries, two coffees, and they spent quite a while in the cafeteria. It was the first time Marina skipped a class. But for Victor, it was the norm. He often overslept, was late, and sometimes, after getting to the college, he would turn to the nearest internet cafe and play games all day. Returning home from the college was not that simple for him. His mother would create a real scandal. Where will you get accepted with such grades? Oh, God bless my nerves. You'll end up in the army. Sonora Cortez lamented while looking at her son's performance in school. Mother's predictions came true. Victor struggled to pass exams and could only get into the paid department. Well, what could be done? They would have to pay. Son, just don't skip college so they don't expel you. Otherwise, you'll end up in the army, Sonora Cortez lamented, mentally calculating whether her savings would be enough to pay for her son's education and live on if, by chance, she lost her job. She raised Victor on her own, and there was nothing more important to her than her son's happiness. With age, this excessive care began to annoy him. Since school, he had been thinking about how nice it would be to move out from his mom's place, but he had nowhere to go. Mom, why are you so obsessed with the army? They might draft me, and that's it. People serve only for a year nowadays. If I get expelled, I'll just go serve, and that'll be the end of it, Victor responded to his mother's comments. Are you a fool? What about hazing? What if you end up in a hot zone? Try not to study, 
and I'll give you a good scolding, Sonora Cortez threatened. You know me, I have a strong character. I strongly advise against defying me. Do what I tell you, and everything will be fine in your life. Once you get your diploma, I'll find you a job. I have some connections. And then we'll see. The main thing is to have an education and a job. Victor was afraid of his mother. She was a tough person with a dominant character. Her word was always law in the family. She divorced Victor's father when Victor was just a year old. He couldn't handle her pressure. Only as an adult, Victor understood that. Although his mother claimed that she had kicked his father out of the house because of his drinking and partying. Your father. I don't even want to talk about him, Sonora Cortez said sternly when Victor asked about him. You've never seen him, and you shouldn't. He would have taught you to drink, party, and do nothing. He lives in another city. After I kicked him out, he left, and I never saw him again. Thank God I haven't seen him in years, and it's better not to know him at all. That's how Sonora Cortez responded to all her son's questions about his father. And he never tried to find out anything himself. It wasn't worth it. Victor was convinced that if his father loved him, he would have found a way to communicate with him. And since he had never even tried to meet in all that time, it meant that his son wasn't needed. Victor didn't want to delve into other details. It wasn't his business. Meeting Marina changed his life. When Victor sat down next to her in the cafeteria, he didn't even think that things could turn out so well. Like her, he had never been popular with girls. Short and with a fairly stocky build, all of this didn't add to his attractiveness, despite having a handsome face. But he still wanted to be in a relationship. After all, he was no longer 15. His body demanded it, and the prospect of living his whole life with his mother was not appealing. A few months after they met, he asked Marina out. She was over the moon with happiness. Victor set aside money for flowers and cafes from the pocket money his mother gave him. He had no intention of combining his studies with work. It was too much of a burden. He understood that she found him attractive, and at a certain point, he decided that they should move in together. The question of where to live was resolved on its own. By that time, Marina already knew about Victor's difficult relationship with his mother, so she offered him to move into one of Sonora Delgado's rooms. At that time, they were living in a good communal apartment not far from the center of capital. Sonora Delgado owned two large and spacious rooms that she inherited from her mother. Marina never knew her father either. Her mother didn't like to talk about him. They separated almost immediately after her birth, and he had no involvement in his daughter's life. Vico, but I need to talk to my mom first, and you need to talk to yours. You can't just leave like that. And I can't bring you home without warning my mom. It's not right. No, of course, she won't kick us out, that's clear, but still, Marina said when they decided to move in together. Yes, I completely agree with you, Victor replied. Then until tomorrow. We won't call each other today. We'll meet at the college as usual. Marina started the conversation with her mother as soon as she got home. Mom, you've seen me, right? Now at least I'm young. Who will need me in five to ten years? Not a single guy has ever paid attention to me. Do you want me to end up an old maid? Marina said with a sad look. What are you talking about? You're a very attractive girl to me. You'll find your happiness. If there's no love between you two, then why move in together? Keep dating and then we'll see. Mom, I love him. He's good, kind, and not stupid. He's getting an education. We're a perfect match for each other. We'll have a good family. Sonora Delgado didn't want to lose her daughter. She was afraid that if she insisted on her position, Marina would leave home. She had no choice but to agree. After all, it was Marina's choice, and she couldn't influence it. Her daughter was already an adult. Sonora Cortez was also not thrilled with this idea. Oh, and now you're leaving your own mother? She said with an annoyed tone when her son mentioned that he was moving in with his girlfriend. 
I raised you all your life, gave you everything, did everything for you, and now you what? Why do you need to live with someone now? And what if you get her pregnant? Goodbye, college and higher education, hello fatherhood and responsibility. It took her some time to calm down and come to terms with her son leaving home. They didn't communicate for almost a year after the move. Sonora Cortez only met Marina just before the wedding a few years later. Well, you've chosen quite a witch, son. You can't even look at her without shedding tears, Sonora Cortez said when she saw Marina. You're such a good boy, and you couldn't find anyone prettier? It's just awful. I refuse to say more, otherwise, I'll faint at the thought of what my grandchildren will look like, Sonora Cortez theatrically rolled her eyes. Mom, please, be quiet. Someone might hear you. Behave yourself, Victor scolded her. When Marina approached to meet her mother-in-law, Sonora Cortez smiled, but from her expression, Marina could tell that she wasn't liked. Throughout their 15 years of living together, they had crossed paths only a few times. In most cases, Victor went to visit his mother alone, without Marina. Just before the wedding, Sonora Delgado sold two rooms in the communal apartment and gave the money to Marina as a down payment for a three-room apartment. At that time, Marina had been working for two years, so the loan was approved quickly. Mari, I did it this way so that we can formalize the deal before the wedding, said Sonora Delgado. This will be your wedding gift. The main thing is that you register the apartment in your name so that he has no claim to it if anything happens. Three rooms, even though far from the city center, is a good thing. If a child is born, it'll have its own room. We'll transfer ownership immediately after birth. But if not, it's still better to have space than to be cramped. Mom, what are you talking about? We're going to register Victor no matter what. He's my husband. And you'll live with us. These are your funds, so you have the right to live in this apartment, Marina said. She was grateful to her mother. Of course, living in a room, even in a very good and decent communal apartment, or in a three-room apartment with her mother was incomparable. After the wedding, Marina registered Victor in the new apartment when they all moved in together, her, him, and Sonora Delgado. Husband and wife should be registered at the same address, as Marina believed. She didn't consider any other options. They lived reasonably well. Marina worked as an economist and earned a good income. True, most of the money went towards the mortgage, but Marina didn't complain. She was grateful to her mother for helping with the apartment purchase, otherwise, they would have lived who knows where. Despite the fact that Victor managed to graduate with difficulty, he never found a decent and steady job. But this didn't upset Marina. She supported her husband in everything. Even when he spent whole days at home after another dismissal, playing computer games, she never said a word about it. They didn't have children. But while Marina was sincerely troubled by this and regularly saved money for complete examinations and treatment if necessary, the absence of heirs didn't bother Victor at all. On the contrary, he sometimes tried to dissuade his wife from this idea. Marina, what's wrong with just the two of us? Why do we need all these examinations? And in different clinics? This money could probably get us a modest car, Victor replied every time Marina brought up the topic of children. Vico, what's going on? Just a few years ago, you wanted children. I don't understand what's changed. Maybe you've stopped loving me? Marina was troubled by her husband's reluctance. She had never seriously considered that he might have been dishonest when he claimed to be eager to become a father. Victor realized that he wasn't ready for this, even emotionally. The sound of a baby crying, sleepless nights, none of that was for him. He was perfectly content with the life he had, and he didn't want to change anything. Marina didn't know that her husband had stopped being faithful and had been seeing his former colleague from work for almost two years. She didn't pay much attention to the fact that they were becoming less intimate. On weekdays, Victor was often delayed somewhere when he was supposed to be at work, and on weekends, he often didn't come home, claiming he was going to the sauna with friends. Marina worked too much and was too tired to analyze her husband's behavior. 
but she didn't give up on the idea of undergoing examinations, even after Victor's numerous pleas. Sonora Delgado worried about her daughter and sincerely couldn't understand why Victor was so opposed to it. They had all the living conditions they needed, and she deliberately purchased a large apartment with a separate room for a child and all amenities. Don't listen to him, she told Marina, don't care about what he thinks. The main thing is that you want a child and that you're able to give birth. You have housing, and you have a job. If anything happens, you can stand on your own feet. And don't get upset, don't despair. I also had you late, and there's nothing wrong with that. Marina felt extremely uncomfortable hearing this. She wanted a child with her beloved husband, dreamed of raising and caring for him together, playing with him, changing diapers. But these plans were not meant to come true. After the examination, she returned home gloomier than a cloud. Victor was absent again. He said he was going fishing with friends. That's even better. I'll share it with his mother first, and then I'll tell him, she thought to herself. When Sonora Delgado heard the diagnosis, she turned pale. Mari, how can this be? You're so young, she began to lament. Mom, let's not do this. Young, old, it's that type of cancer that can strike anyone. I'll have more examinations at several other clinics, consult with doctors. But the test results were bleak everywhere. If after the first examination Marina still had some hope that the doctor had made a mistake, after visiting three more specialists, she had to come to terms with her fate. Mari, but this can be treated, right? You will undergo treatment, won't you? Sonora Delgado understood that this was a rhetorical question. Marina would undoubtedly undergo treatment, and Sonora Delgado would do everything to help her recover. But there was no guarantee that the treatment would be successful. Six months of chemotherapy had yielded only minor results. Marina had even started to believe that someday she would recover and return to her old life. But a few months later, the tumor began to grow again. The disease was progressing rapidly. Marina barely had time to realize it before she could no longer move on her own. The pain was excruciating, and Sonora Delgado called for an ambulance. A few days later, Marina was admitted to a hospice. Victor reacted indifferently to what was happening, and Sonora Delgado could clearly see it. Not that he didn't care at all, but right after Marina was taken to the hospital, he initiated a conversation about how to move forward. No words of sympathy or regret. He had to take on two jobs to continue paying the mortgage. There was very little left, and he hoped that in the event of his wife's death, the apartment would legally become his. Sonora Delgado spent all her time at the hospital. She could see her daughter fading away, and deep down, she knew it. She desperately wanted to believe that everything would turn out fine, even though there was almost no hope left. On this day, she was getting ready to go to the hospital. The morning argument with her son-in-law hadn't affected her mood. She was now convinced that he was a terrible person and hoped that once Marina recovered, she would divorce him and kick him out of the apartment. She wanted to believe that. Just as she was about to leave the house, she heard the phone ring. It was a call from the hospital. Yes, I'm listening, she answered anxiously. I'm very sorry, came the voice from the other end. Well, tell me already, what happened? Your daughter passed away an hour ago. Please accept my condolences. What? But she was alive just yesterday. Sonora Delgado, we all understand. We saw a few days ago that she had very little time left. We just didn't tell you, and you didn't ask. We will contact the morgue and let you know when you can pick up the body. Bring the necessary documents. Once again, my condolences. Short beeps sounded from the other end of the line, but Sonora Delgado didn't even pay attention. For her, the world had turned upside down the very moment she heard the doctor's words. She sank down against the wall in the corridor and burst into tears. Her dear Marina, her only daughter, her flesh and blood, was gone, and she was still alive. Only then did she realize how terrifying it was when children left this world before their parents. I'm going to the country house for a few days, want to visit the church, 
talk to the friendly priest, and be alone, said Sonora Delgado after the funeral. Don't you dare cause any trouble while I'm gone. I'll deal with you when I get back. And, Victor, you should consider moving in with your mother. No shame, no conscience. You stood at the funeral like a statue and acted at the memorial service as if you hadn't buried your wife but had come for a tea party. Shameful. It's not for you to reproach me, Sonora Delgado, retorted Victor. Leave your morality to yourself. We still have to divide the property in six months. Don't forget that. I've been paying the mortgage for the past year and still am, so I have no intention of giving anything up to you. Victor, I've told you everything. You won't get anything, don't even hope for it. Marina bought this apartment before she married you. And my money was spent on the down payment, which can be easily proven. Don't count your chickens before they're hatched. You can go live with your mother if she'll have you, of course. Although I kick such a son out of my life. We'll see who gets what, replied Sonora Delgado. The court will force you to reimburse me for the money I paid for the loan or allocate me a share. In any case, I won't be leaving here for the next six months. I'm registered here, don't forget. And if you think I'm not serious, I might as well quit my job and stop paying the mortgage. Your pitiful pension won't even cover half the payment, so the bailiffs will kick you out long before six months. Then you'll go with me, Victor. What nonsense are you talking? Have you lost your mind completely? Who's the one losing their mind here? I told you everything. Go to your country house. Have a safe trip. Sonora Delgado closed the door behind her and headed for the bus to the house. The journey was not short and she needed to arrive by evening. On the way, she thought about the need to close the mortgage early when she returned. She had savings, but would they be enough to pay off the loan? In the worst case, I can pay for a few months and then find a job to cover the remaining payments, she thought to herself. She set a goal for herself to evict Victor from the apartment. Unlike her daughter, she had never felt any sympathy for him. He had never become a family member for her. He always acted solely in his own interests, never thinking of anyone else, and had practically driven Marina to her death. Sonora Delgado held Victor responsible for her daughter's death. He had never been a source of support or stability for the family. Unfortunately, she also felt responsible for not raising Marina to be more self-assured, and she blamed herself as a mother. For many years, Marina practically worked for a single mortgage. Yes, she had decent income, but the payments were quite substantial, and the lion's share of her salary went toward repaying them. She even supported her husband. He clung on like a tick. Got used to living off his mother. Same story here. When I want to, I work. When I don't, I don't. These thoughts only made Sonora Delgado feel worse. She wanted to confess and talk to the priest as soon as possible. She deliberately went to the church located near her dacha. She attended it, but only in the summer when she went on vacation to the country house. She was well acquainted with the priest and trusted only him. She wanted to bury Marina in the cemetery near the country house, but in winter, many of her daughter's friends and acquaintances wouldn't go there. Sonora Delgado wanted everyone to say their goodbyes properly and visit the grave whenever they wished. She didn't yet know that an extremely unpleasant surprise awaited her when she returned home. After coming back to the city three days later, she tried to open the apartment door with her key but couldn't. Victor, what is this? shouted Sonora Delgado, kicking the door with all her might. Victor, open the door quickly. I'll call the police right now. I'm not joking. For a moment, Sonora Delgado pressed her ear to the door, trying to hear what was happening inside, but she couldn't hear any movements. A disturbing thought crossed her mind. Could he have died in there? What are you making all this noise for? We have a little child sleeping here, by the way and you're shouting, banging your feet on the door. This is outrageous. A neighbor from the floor above emerged from the apartment and scolded Sonora Delgado after descending the stairs. I'm sorry, replied Sonora Delgado, my son-in-law is the only one home. I was away at the dacha for three days. 
I came back, and the door is locked. I can't open it. So why are you trying to break the door? Call the police. Let them come and open it. Or is this not your apartment? If it's not, then you should leave. He's not obliged to let you in at your first demand. The building was large, and there were many neighbors. Sonora Delgado wasn't acquainted with all of them, and this woman was someone she had seen for the first time. I apologize once again, continued Sonora Delgado. You're probably right. I should contact the police. Then call them, but don't break the door, the neighbor snapped and, going back upstairs, slammed her own apartment door. After standing on the stairs for a few minutes, Sonora Delgado descended to the street. It was very cold outside. She was exhausted and tired. She didn't even have the strength to call the police. She decided to sit on a bench near the entrance and rest. Returning from the country house, Sonora Delgado was hoping to get some sleep. The previous days had passed like a blur. Each day, she visited churches, prayed for her late daughter, and hardly slept because nightmares haunted her. All right, it's easier to walk to the police station than to make a call and wait. After all, they might not even come, she thought to herself and quietly made her way to the tram stop. The police station was about a 30-minute walk from her home. Sonora Delgado wouldn't have been able to cover such a distance on foot. Sitting in the tram, she thought about how she could simply call locksmiths, showing them her registered address and her passport. They wouldn't have the right to refuse. However, she had suspicions that Victor deliberately changed the locks, but she couldn't understand why he would do that. Was he counting on the fact that she wouldn't make a scene and, freezing outside, would return to the country house for half a year? Living in a semi-rural house in winter was very challenging, but it wasn't just about that. Why should she give up the apartment into which she had invested all the money she had, fully paid for with her late daughter's earnings? Why on earth? Arriving at the police station, she thought that it was actually good that things turned out this way. Now she had a legal opportunity to kick this scoundrel out of her house. But it wasn't that simple. Hello. I have this situation. My son-in-law kicked me out of the house and changed the locks. Who can I turn to? Sonora Delgado asked the officer on duty when she entered the police station. Hello, please explain in more detail how he kicked you out of the house. Are you registered at the residence where he changed the locks, and are you sure he actually changed them? Maybe something happened to him? Yes, I am registered in this apartment. My daughter died a week ago. We lived in the apartment together, me, her, and her husband. The apartment is registered in my daughter's name, and both I and my son-in-law are listed on it. I went to the country house for three days, and when I returned, I couldn't get into the apartment. Are you sure everything is okay with your son-in-law? If you're suggesting that he's so devastated by his wife's death that he took his own life, it's unlikely, Sonora Delgado replied sarcastically. Write a statement. We can open the apartment based on the need to check for an accident. What kind of accident? She asked slightly confused, I told you, my son-in-law kicked me out of the house. How can locks not open? Obviously, they were changed. What else could it be? Write a statement, the officer on duty said, handing Sonora Delgado a piece of paper and a pen. How long will it take for the apartment to be opened? I have nowhere to go, not even a place to spend the night. I would like to get into my apartment, where I am registered and have the right to reside according to the law. I've heard you. As soon as you write a statement, our team will go with you. We'll open the apartment, make sure everything is fine with your son-in-law, and then discuss your family situation further. Most likely, what happened between you falls outside our jurisdiction. You'll need to resolve it in court, as it's not a criminal matter. But he had absolutely no right to kick you out of the house since you are registered there. We'll get to the bottom of everything. Two hours later, the police team opened the apartment. Sonora Delgado immediately noticed a pair of unfamiliar women's shoes in the hallway. She rushed into her daughter's room and found Victor sleeping alongside another woman. The room reeked of alcohol, empty bottles stood on the floor, and there were remnants of food on the plates. 
So here's your son-in-law. As you can see, he's alive, well, and even looks quite good, said the police officer. Sonora Delgado grabbed the blanket from the bed, seized the frightened girl by her hair, and dragged her down the hallway. The police officer had a hard time pulling the enraged woman away from the girl and tried to calm them both down. You rich. You scum. Get out of here. Shouted Sonora Delgado. Don't touch me. Let me throw her out into the stairwell. She yelled at the police. Please calm down. Otherwise, I'll have to hold you accountable for assault and hooliganism as well, the police officer said sternly. I'm sorry. But you understand, my girl hasn't been buried for long, and he's already lying in her apartment, in her bed, with some tramp. What a scoundrel, my God. Sonora Delgado burst into tears, and the police officer continued to console her. He genuinely felt sorry for this poor woman and sympathized with her grief. Here, take my passport, the blonde girl handed her document to the police officer. My name is Alejandra, it's all written there. Just so you know, I'm not a prostitute or anything like that. I came to visit him. We've been dating for a long time, over a year. You rich. Sonora Delgado exclaimed again, staring at the bewildered Victor, who, due to his hangover, was struggling to understand what was happening. After reviewing the documents, the police officer returned Alejandra's passport. Everything is fine, you're free to go, he said. Alejandra rushed into the hallway, looking stunned. She quickly put on her jacket, her boots, and left the apartment. Now, let's sort this out, suggested the police officer. Sonora Delgado, let's allow Victor to get dressed. Afterward, he'll provide us with his documents and explain what happened. Then, I'll clarify your rights and responsibilities. Sonora Delgado had no energy left even to be angry. She could only think about how her dear Marina must be turning in her grave, witnessing all of this. Half an hour later, Victor, the district officer, and Sonora Delgado gathered in the kitchen. Victor, please explain what happened. Your mother-in-law stated in her complaint that you kicked her out of the house and changed the locks. When she came home, she couldn't access her own residence, the investigator said. Well, you're aware that my wife passed away, right? She probably told you, began Victor, his speech slurred from the effects of alcohol. And who is the heir to the wife? Right, the lawful husband. So, I'm the heir, and I have every right to change the locks. As for this one, he looked contemptuously in Sonora Delgado's direction, a la Victor through the courts. Once I sober up completely, I'll go to court and kick her out. I must disappoint you, the investigator continued, Sonora Delgado is registered here. This is her permanent place of residence. You can only formalize your wife's inheritance after six months, but you won't be able to become the sole owner of the entire apartment in any case. If your wife didn't leave a will, then according to the law, you will receive only half of the apartment and the other half will be inherited by your mother-in-law, Sonora Delgado. You can't evict her under any circumstances, so you'll have to coexist on the same property until the inheritance is settled. Afterward, you can complete all the necessary paperwork and sell the apartment. Changing locks is strictly prohibited, and you will be held accountable for it. You can only have guests in the house until 11 p.m. unless you've made other arrangements with Sonora Delgado. Victor became visibly tense. Anger and hatred flickered in his eyes. Completely losing control, he lunged at the police officer, shouting, I'll take care of you right now, you damn lawman. Two police officers pulled Victor away, restrained him, and handcuffed him. We'll take the man to the station. Let him think about it for 15 days. Draw up a protocol for hooliganism, the police officer told his colleague while holding Victor's hands behind his back. And you, sir, if you keep causing trouble, we could extend it to 30 days. Give the keys to Sonora Delgado. They're on the table. In the room, Victor grumbled discontentedly to himself. Sonora Delgado, please check, and then we'll say our goodbyes, said the police officer. She went into the room, took the keys, opened and closed the door several times. 
Everything is in order, said Sonora Delgado. Thank you for your help, for your promptness. Thank you for coming. If it weren't for you, I don't know what I would have done then. Thank you. No need for thanks. It's our job. And don't worry so much. Regarding the apartment, consult with a good civil lawyer. I would help here, but I don't understand anything about it, the policeman said with a smile. Sonora Delgado closed the door to the apartment, walked into the room, and collapsed on the bed. She was so tired over the past few days that she could barely grasp reality. She fell asleep almost immediately. Worries temporarily took a back seat. In reality, they were just beginning, and she understood that perfectly well. How dare you file a report with the police about my son? Sonora Cortez burst into Sonora Delgado's apartment at 8 in the morning and immediately started accusing her. I'm asking you again, how dare you? Last night, I called my son, couldn't reach him. In the morning, I started calling morgues, hospitals, and came to the police to report a missing person. And now it turns out he's been in the lockup since yesterday. Do you even realize what they might do to him during these 15 days? Sonora Cortez, let's calm down, go into the apartment, and we'll talk like reasonable, civilized people, Sonora Delgado calmly replied. You are yelling so loudly the whole staircase can hear you. I couldn't care less about you and your neighbors. I'll go in, yes, with your permission. You seem to think this is your house only. But I'll only go in to tell you everything I think of you, and I'd be glad to never see you again. I used to hold back after all, my son was married to your daughter. But now I have nothing to hold back for. Sonora Delgado closed the door to the apartment and Sonora Cortez immediately went into the kitchen without even taking off her shoes. So here's what I want to tell you, Sonora Delgado. If anything happens to my son, I'll make your life a living hell. You'll remember me for a long time, she continued. I told him from the beginning that he shouldn't get involved with your daughter. It wouldn't lead to anything good. And what's the result? He spent a year on your rundown property, and now you want to take everything away from him? What audacity! Sonora Cortez, your son only spent a year working, and the rest of the time my daughter was supporting the family. And yes, in case you've forgotten, he was in and out of work. Their entire life together was tumultuous. Only my marina brought any bread to the family. And your son had the audacity to bring some floozy into her apartment, into her room, right after her death. Do you think that's normal? So, what you mean, he's not supposed to live now, is that it? Marina died, Marina won't come back. But my son is still young, he's only 35, he has a whole life ahead of him. He's in the prime of his life. Didn't you think that he might bury himself next to your daughter? God forbid. I've never wished anything bad for Victor. But his behavior has crossed all acceptable human boundaries. Let him bring his floozies into your apartment. Let them have a blast right in front of you. But there won't be a trace of his woman here, I promise you. And he won't get any share of the apartment. Don't even dream about it. We'll see about that. Legally, he should get half of Marina's remaining property. After all, they were married for 15 years. It's not child's play. Not 15, but 10. The first five years they were just living together. And I really didn't want my daughter to tie her fate to your son. I understood what kind of person he was back then. My son did Marina a favor when he married her. She saw herself in the mirror and, unlike you, didn't have illusions. She evaluated her husband and did everything to keep him from leaving. Who else would need her? You, Sonora Delgado, have too high an opinion of your daughter. Not only was she unattractive, but she was also a sterile flower. For all those years, she didn't give birth to a single child for my son. Because she couldn't. And she couldn't do to her bony figure. She had no health, she was nothing but skin and bones. Where would children come from? Sonora Cortez said with a smirk. After these words, Sonora Delgado couldn't bear it anymore and grabbed Sonora Cortez by the hair. What are you doing? 
Have you gone mad? Let go of me. I'll go to the police. Sonora Cortez screamed in pain. What a grip. Release me immediately. I couldn't care less where you go. Listen here. If you ever show up at my doorstep again and dare to say a word about my daughter, I'll strangle you with these very hands. I have nothing to lose. So, did I make myself clear? Sonora Delgado tightened her grip on Sonora Cortez's hair and tilted her head back. Crystal clear, crystal clear. I'm leaving. You're insane. It's dangerous to be in the same room with you. My son would really be better off living with me until the inheritance is sorted out, or else you might hurt him, or God forbid, kill him. Sonora Cortez got up from the kitchen table and headed for the exit. Goodbye, I won't keep you, Sonora Delgado said, turning the key in the lock. She didn't expect this behavior from herself, but she couldn't bear to listen to insults about Marina from a woman she had barely seen, maybe five times in her life, and who didn't even attend the funeral. No mother could endure such an insult. After Sonora Cortez left, Sonora Delgado cried for two hours, then called several law firms and made an appointment for a consultation. We can communicate online if this format is more convenient for you. In this age of modern technology, there is no need to waste your time on unnecessary trips, the young woman said politely. The online format isn't quite for me. I don't understand computers very well, Sonora Delgado replied. Can we talk on the phone? Yes, of course. After explaining the situation, the lawyer assured her that the property acquired before the marriage was not considered communal property and wouldn't be divided. The lawyer also inquired about Marina's accounts and other assets. The attorney explained that it would depend on whether Marina had left a will. In any case, her husband could try to contest it in court, but given the circumstances of his behavior in recent years and his actions after his wife's death, such a process was unlikely to be successful. However, it would be worth gathering evidence that Victor had only played a minor role in the family's life, often remained unemployed, rarely visited his spouse when she was ill, cheated, and behaved improperly. Sonora Delgado didn't know if Marina had left a will. Her daughter had never been secretive and had always trusted her mother in everything. But she might not have shared such an important detail. Sonora Delgado also had to close the mortgage herself. Considering that almost all her savings had been spent on Marina's treatment, this was quite problematic. At the bank, she learned that there were still 50000 left to pay. Sonora Delgado had 110000 in her account, but she was afraid to spend them. She needed to leave some money for Marina's memorial, and she herself was not a young person and could require medical treatment at any time. She faced one of the most difficult decisions in her life. Replenishing the spent savings quickly wasn't possible because her pension was very small. It would take more than five years to restore the previous amount. But sharing the apartment, in which she had invested almost all the money she had and on which Marina had worked for many years, with that moral degenerate, her ex-husband, was something she absolutely didn't want. It was unacceptable and would simply defile her daughter's memory. The decision was made by itself. The next day, Sonora Delgado went to the bank and transferred the missing amount to close the mortgage. Then she went to the funeral home, made a down payment for the monument, and scheduled its installation for a month later. Returning home, she felt calm and free for the first time in a long while. The problems were solved, and even though partially, she didn't experience such strong stress anymore. And, of course, she didn't know what awaited her ahead. Fifteen days later, why haven't I been able to reach you for two weeks now? I've been calling and calling, but your phone is unavailable. I saw the notification that you appeared online, and I called immediately. Vico, what's going on? Are you avoiding me? Sandra said in an anxious voice. I apologize for misunderstanding your previous request. Here's the passage with direct speech indicated by hyphens. No, Sandra, I'm not avoiding you. How could you think that? I've just been released from prison. I'm on my way home now, Victor replied. What are you saying? Released from prison, Vico? 
What happened? Sonora Delgado filed a complaint against me because I changed the locks. Well, you remember that scandal. You witnessed it all. When you left, the police officer called us into the kitchen and started explaining our rights and all. Well, I couldn't take it and expressed everything I thought. So, they locked me up for 15 days. Where are you now? I'm going to my mom's place. I'm sure she's already talked to Sonora Delgado. Maybe they've come to some agreement, but I won't go back there for sure. It's dangerous. Who knows what else that old crazy lady might come up with. She's completely lost her mind after her daughter's death. Anyway, let's not dwell on the sad stuff. How are you? Vico, we need to meet urgently and talk. It's very important. Sandra, I've just come out of that hellhole. I want to go home, take a proper shower, eat, get some sleep. Let's talk tomorrow. We can meet somewhere in the city. We'll go to a cafe, sit down and talk. Vico, it has to be today. It's really urgent. Okay, I'll head home now. I'll take a shower, eat, get a few hours of sleep, and then I'll come over wherever you say. Is that okay? Yes, all right, we've agreed. Let's meet in some cafe downtown, maybe on Central Street, for instance. Sandra, it's expensive there. How about I come to your area, and we'll figure it out from there. Okay, that works. But I definitely won't be able to sit in my place, don't count on it. Both my mother and father will be at home all day. Alright, for now. I'll call you when I'm on my way. He was almost falling from exhaustion as he walked back home. One thing made him happy, it was nothing like Sonora Delgado's place. He was sure that his mom had prepared all his favorite dishes for his arrival so he could eat well and get some rest. My dear boy, how are you? Are you all right? Sonora Cortez rushed to hug her son right from the doorstep. These two weeks had been like torture for her. She'd wake up at five in the morning and struggle to fall asleep. She couldn't sit still. Various thoughts, unpleasant ones, kept haunting her mind, and she tried her best to push them away. Oh, look how overgrown you are, my dear, she continued to fuss. Mom, calm down, everything's fine. Yes, it's not paradise there, not even close, but it's bearable. They didn't beat me, and they even fed me. Although I can hardly call that slop they serve their food, Victor said with a smirk and immediately went to the bathroom to wash his hands. Sweetie, I've prepared everything. I counted the days and knew they would release you this morning. Last night, I even called the police just to be sure. If they hadn't let you go, I would have given them a piece of my mind. I've made some pastries. I'll make your favorite omelet now. I didn't prepare it in advance so it wouldn't get cold. Mom, I'm going to take a shower. You can make the omelet in the meantime. While Victor ate, Sonora Cortez tried to explain to him why it would be better not to return to Sonora Delgado's apartment until the property division was settled. Are you serious? Did she really attack you like that? Victor asked with a surprised and shocked expression. Mom, you're really making a fuss. It's a shame I wasn't there. Vico Vico, why did you bring that girl to her apartment? Why did you get into a scandal? You do understand that all of this will be used against you, Sonora Cortez lamented. Why couldn't you meet somewhere else? Why did you change the locks? Mom, it's my apartment, my right. I'm the lawful husband, which means I'm the heir. Why should I ask her for permission to bring someone to my own apartment? Son, but you do realize that you'll become the full lawful heir only six months after Marina's death, and even then, it's not guaranteed. What do you mean by not guaranteed? Victor slammed his fist on the table. Do you want to convince me, like those investigators, that I have no rights? Vico, don't get angry. You know the laws yourself. Of course, we'll fight for the apartment, but we need to do it smartly, not impulsively. All right, go rest. I have a meeting in the evening. Wake me up around 8 so I can get there by 9 or I'll oversleep. I'm so tired. 
And who are you meeting with, if it's not a secret? With Sandra. It turns out she's been trying to call me for these past two weeks, looking for me. She doesn't have your phone number, and I didn't have a chance to tell her that I got detained for 15 days. Son, is it serious between you two? I don't know, Mom. We met at my previous job, and we started dating when Marina's problems really escalated. I just couldn't take it anymore. You know, she disappears at work, makes plans known only to her, or spends the whole day in the kitchen with her mom. I was exhausted. But Sandra, she's different. I don't know if it's serious. I've accumulated enough in my marriage, so I'm definitely not planning to marry her. Well, you can meet her here. I won't mind. I understand everything. You're a grown man with needs. Besides, I still visit Elena sometimes, or I go to the country with my friends. Just tell me when you need to meet. We can coordinate, so to speak. All right, Mom, thank you so much. You're the best. Victor fell asleep as soon as his head touched the pillow. He didn't yet know what Sandra was going to tell him, so there was no need to worry. But when he heard the reason she called him for the meeting, he was stunned. This was something he definitely didn't expect. It was so untimely and unexpected that at first, he was speechless and didn't know how to respond. So, what did you want to tell me? What's so urgent that I had to come here instead of sleeping after everything I've been through in the last two weeks? Victor asked without preamble as soon as he sat down at the cafe table, where Sandra was already waiting for him. Vico, I'm pregnant, she said with a smile. We're going to have a child. He tried not to show that he was in shock. This was definitely not part of his plan. After a minute of heavy silence, Sandra continued. Aren't you happy? I thought you'd be delighted. I'm sorry for asking, but are you sure it's my child? He asked. Of course, it's yours. Whose else could it be? Vico, how could you even think otherwise? No, that's not what I meant at all. I'm sorry. I just wanted to be sure, just in case. So, what are you planning to do? What do you mean? Give birth, of course. Vico, are you really not happy? I thought we were serious about each other. Sandra, have you thought about where we'll live? And more importantly, how? You'll be on maternity leave. My job is very unstable right now. And after that stunt by Sonora Delgado and 15 days for hooliganism, it's unclear what will happen. We don't have our own place to live, unless it's with your parents or mine. And there's also the age difference between us. Well, it's not exactly ideal for marriage. What do you mean, not ideal? What are you talking about? Well, think about it. I'm 35. I'm an adult man, I've been married before, and I have no intention of getting married again, at least not in the near future. And you're only 24. You're still very young. Why would you want this? So, you're suggesting getting rid of the baby? Vico, are you out of your mind? I'm suggesting being sensible. I can't provide anything for you, and you knew that when we started dating. We never planned to start a family. Our relationship was purely for enjoyment. We had a good time together, and it should continue that way. I don't see the point in complicating things. Think about it yourself. You're not a foolish person, Sandra. Vico, well, I love you, after all. When we started dating, I thought we'd get married eventually. Not immediately, of course, but after some time when your wife is no longer around. After the funeral, with time passing. I didn't think it was so answerious for you. Sandra, but you'll still have plenty of children. You're young, after all. And I'm already over 30. Please, understand me correctly. I've been married, I lived in a family, and I don't want to start all over again. So, what are you suggesting the moving in with my mom or your parents? What if my mom doesn't like you, like she didn't like Marina? She just hated her. And we were the same age, classmates, and essentially a good match. And your parents, will they be thrilled to have me as a son-in-law? 
To tolerate my potential mother-in-law for another 20 years until the child grows up? I'm definitely not ready. I'm sorry. Sandra was completely bewildered by what she had just heard. She genuinely thought that Victor loved her. She loved him for who he was. Yes, there were more attractive and successful men in her circle, but she didn't care about them at all. Her peers never interested her, nor did men who were much older. Victor had something intangible about him. She couldn't even explain what it was, but she felt he was the right person for her. And now, it turned out Victor had always seen things differently. Victor, I didn't expect this from you, she said, trying to hold back tears. Well, what kind of person did you expect me to be? Come on, tell me. Why the generalization? I don't see anything wrong with wanting to live alone for a while. I've lived with a wife for 15 years. Yes, at first, it doesn't seem so bad. There are certainly advantages. But back then, I was a student, very young and inexperienced. I was glad to move away from my mom, who sometimes smothered me with her cares to the point where I wanted to escape to the other side of the world. I was glad to have a woman by my side with whom I could always spend time and get what I needed. Yes, it was comfortable, delicious, and clean. But over time, marriage becomes unbearable. Especially when she starts asserting her rights, constantly nags, saying she wants children, she needs this, she needs that. And you yourself don't need anything, everything suits you as it is, but you have to pretend that you're participating in family life because she's your wife. You can't just explode, start shouting, or refuse something. I'm sick of all of this, and I'm not going back to that routine under any circumstances. I'm sorry. Sandra slapped him across the face, tears streaming down her face, and stormed out of the cafe. Victor was very angry, but not at her, but at the situation in general. Lord, how they all annoy me. They've been pushing their way into my life, telling me how to live and what to do. How long can this go on, he thought to himself and seethed with frustration. Having finished his coffee and paid the bill, Victor walked out onto the street and simply wandered around the city for about two hours. He associated the fresh air with freedom. The very same freedom he had never actually had. At first, it was his mother who controlled him, then his mother-in-law and his wife, and now there was this Sandra with her child. It was too much for him. After Marina's death, he wanted to inherit and just live peacefully, alone, the way he wanted, not the way someone else would dictate. Is it really too big a desire to become a reality? He wondered. When he realized he could no longer aimlessly roam the city, he started heading to the subway. Already underground, as he sat on the train and listened to the soothing sound of the wheels, a dreadful idea came to his mind. Throughout the journey, he thought about how to arrange things so that he would be beyond suspicion, and he came up with a plan. At that time, he did not yet know what it would lead to because he was too confident in himself. His excessive self-assurance turned out to be unjustified. Victor would only understand this when it was already too late. It had been 40 days since Marina's death. Son, do you have any plans for today? Sonora Cortez asked with concern. Today is the 40th day since Marina passed away. Mom, I remember. And she's no longer my Marina. If you haven't forgotten, she's dead. So, what's the question? Sonora Delgado hasn't organized anything. Even if there were any memorial services, she probably won't invite me. Although I'm more than sure that nothing will happen. Or do you want me to visit her? Mom, I don't understand you. One moment you're telling me to stay away from that woman and not get close to her apartment even with a long stick, and the next moment, you're asking about Marina. Make up your mind. No, son, I'm not telling you anything. I was just interested in your plans for today. I'm planning to meet with Sandra. I'll finish breakfast now and then get ready. Vico, can I ask you one question? Mom, go ahead, of course. Just ask faster, or I won't be back home until late again. How's your job? Well, the old one is understandable. You got fired. But in general? 
Mom, why all these questions? What kind of job can I have now after everything that's happened to me? I'm stressed out. Give me some time to recover. I'll find something in a couple of weeks. Vico, why are you getting upset? I just asked, that's all. All right, Mom. That's it, I'm going to get ready. He hadn't told her anything about Sandra's pregnancy, and since she ran away from the cafe that day, he hadn't seen her, hadn't called her, and hadn't written to her. He had no need for it, and now he was going not to meet Sandra, but to see Sonora Delgado. He had wisely decided not to tell his mother about it. He didn't know what Sonora Delgado was doing today. If she had indeed organized a memorial service, he would be an uninvited guest, and all his plans would fall apart. But if not, he would do what he had planned. He simply had no other options. He couldn't afford to miss the opportunity to inherit a three-room apartment, which he could sell at a profit, buy a one-room apartment for himself, and live peacefully for quite some time on the remaining difference from the sale. And he had no intention of doing so. Gathering his thoughts, he went to the cemetery to visit Marina. On the way, he bought some flowers. When he reached the grave, he saw Sonora Delgado sitting next to it. She was in tears. He quietly approached and sat down beside her, placing the flowers on the grave. Oh, my daughter, I didn't protect you. Forgive me. I'm a bad mother, a terrible one, lamented Sonora Delgado. She didn't even notice when Victor sat down next to her. It was only after a few minutes that she turned her head toward him and asked, Why did you come here? How dare you? Scoundrel. Rich. Sonora Delgado, you are wrong to think that way. I'm going through a tough time too. Marina and I weren't complete strangers. We lived together for so many years. I was unfair to her, Victor struggled to shed a tear for the sake of his sincerity. She was a good person, a good wife, but I wasn't very good, he continued. Oh, Victor, I don't believe in your remorse. If you were truly remorseful, you wouldn't have brought a loose woman into the house so quickly. And you cheated on my marina. You're a real scoundrel. Although, on the other hand, all men sin in this way. It's our sad lot as women to wipe your drool all your life and endure your escapades. You shouldn't doubt my remorse, Sonora Delgado. While I was in prison, I thought a lot about how I kicked you out into the cold and changed the locks at home, and about our life with Marina and our relationship. I was wrong in many ways, but you can't turn back time. Besides, I'm not so young anymore to change. Truth is truth. Well, however reluctantly, you're still my son-in-law. We've lived under the same roof for so many years. Let's remember my marina. We'll sit down, have a drink or two in her memory. At that moment, Sonora Delgado was very vulnerable, and Victor understood that. She needed someone by her side right now, someone to keep her company, immerse themselves in shared memories of her beloved daughter, and talk about her and only her. Victor despite his behavior, was perfect for this role. She took the bait, he thought to himself, and, out of courtesy, asked just in case. Didn't you invite anyone for the memorial service? Victor, we don't invite people to memorial services. People come on their own if they want to. And if they don't want to or can't, they remember the deceased at home. Victor called a taxi, and they went to Sonora Delgado's home. On the way, they stopped at a store. To appear genuinely moved, Victor bought everything necessary. Sonora Delgado didn't believe a word, he said. But on this day, she simply couldn't bear to be alone. She couldn't even imagine what Victor had in mind and how bitterly she would regret inviting him over. You know, I've decided not to claim the apartment, Victor, slightly tipsy, said. It's wrong and unfair. Marina worked so hard for all those years, and you helped us a lot back in the day. My mother's place is quite spacious, it'll be enough for me. Sonora Delgado had also had enough to drink. They sat, remembering Marina, not even noticing how time passed. You must still have some childhood photos of Marina, right? Victor continued. Of course, I have several albums. 
When my little Marina was born, we didn't have the technology they have now. We had to develop the photos from film, said Sonora Delgado. Please bring them. I'd love to see them. Marina never showed me her photos. Sonora Delgado went into the room to retrieve the albums. She always treated the photos very carefully, keeping them on the top shelf to prevent anyone else from seeing them. She spent about five minutes in the room. In that time, the tablets had completely dissolved. When Sonora Delgado returned to the kitchen, Victor pretended to be engrossed in looking at Marina's photos. He was a bit tipsy but clearly understood what was happening and stuck to his plan. Well, Victor, how about another drink? For the repose of my dear Marina's soul, said Sonora Delgado, holding that ominous glass. Let's drink. No need to hold back, Victor replied and immediately bit into some bread and cucumber. She was such an interesting and unique child in her childhood, he continued, pretending to be enthusiastic about Marina's photos. Yes, she was a very special girl to me. And so clever, so clever. They continued discussing Marina for about 20 more minutes, after which Sonora Delgado carefully lowered her head onto the table and fell asleep. Victor waited for another 10 minutes to make absolutely sure she was asleep. Then he washed all the glasses and put them in a bag. After that, he went into the room to fetch acetone. Despite Marina's quite extraordinary appearance, she loved doing her nails. Taking a bottle of the liquid, Victor splashed it on the table, then stepped into the hallway and lit a cigarette. Everything had to look natural. He threw the almost burnt out cigarette into the kitchen and a fire started. He quickly opened the door, locked it from the other side, and rushed downstairs. The fire spread quickly, but not as fast as Victor would have liked. After all, it was just nail polish remover, with only a few percent actual acetone. But he was confident that there was no saving Sonora Delgado at this point. He had meticulously planned everything in advance. Even a completely burned down apartment was too expensive to give up. Restoration, repairs, none of that seemed like important issues to him. The most crucial thing was the walls. The expensive walls of the capital, of which he would soon become the full-fledged owner. At the time, he had no idea how wrong he was. What are you all doing here? Let me through. We urgently need to take a woman to the hospital, otherwise she might die, a doctor said sternly and loudly to the people who had gathered near the entrance to see the fire. What a horror. This is a real nightmare. What will happen to this poor woman now? They exclaimed among themselves. Excuse me, do you happen to know what happened here? Sandra asked one of the women standing nearby. Girl, there's a fire. One of the apartments caught fire. Can't you see? A 70-year-old woman grumbled. Are you from the neighboring building too? Here to have a look. Sandra didn't answer that question and immediately tried to approach the ambulance. Oh my God, it's Sonora Delgado, Victor's mother-in-law, flashed through her mind. Excuse me, may I ask, will she survive? Sandra tugged at one of the doctors in the team. Girl, who are you anyway? Are you a relative? He asked. Not exactly. Yes and no. I'm an acquaintance of her son-in-law. Can I ride along with you? The patient is in a very critical condition. I doubt you can help her with anything. It would be better to visit her once she regains consciousness. Which hospital are you taking her to? To the District City Hospital. It's the only around. That's it, miss. Don't get in the way. Every minute counts for us. Sandra had come to find out Victor's address. She wanted to talk to him once more, but he hadn't answered her calls or texts. She had no other way to find out where he lived. At work, they didn't disclose personal information about former employees, and she couldn't ask anyone for help. Standing by the entrance, Sandra tried calling him again. This time, not just to talk to him, but also to inform him about what had happened to his mother-in-law. He probably doesn't even know what's happening now, she thought to herself. But he didn't pick up the phone again, and she left empty-handed. Vico, what's wrong with you? 
I can smell alcohol on you. Have you been drinking? Sonora Cortez began to question him right from the doorway. She immediately noticed that something was wrong with her son. He seemed out of sorts. Yes, we had a few drinks with Sandra. What's wrong with that? He retorted. Well, I didn't say anything like that. I just asked. Am I not allowed to ask any questions? You can, Mom, you can, but let's talk about it later. He quickly slipped into his room, unpacked the bag containing the crystal clear glasses, and placed them on the farthest shelf of the sideboard. Ideally, I should throw them away, of course, but for now, let them stay, he thought to himself. Victor fell asleep almost immediately and woke up the next morning when Sonora Cortez entered his room. Son, why did you sleep in so late today? Are you feeling unwell? I've already prepared breakfast, she said gently, partially opening the door. No, Mom, I'm perfectly fine. I'll be right there. After yesterday's events, all he wanted was to rest, lie in bed, watch TV, and, most importantly, not think about anything. He was sure that he had executed his plan flawlessly. His thoughts were interrupted by a series of knocks on the door. Lord, who could it be now? Sonora Cortez muttered as she went to answer the door. Who's there? Open up. Police. Came the voice from behind the door. We didn't call the police. Open the door immediately. You have no right to obstruct us. Your son is suspected of intentionally arson of an apartment and attempted murder. Sonora Cortez turned cold and entered Victor's room. I don't understand anything, Vico. What's happening? She asked anxiously. What arson? What police? What's going on? Mom, don't open the door for them. Delay them somehow while I make a rope from bed sheets and escape through the window, Victor replied fearfully, already in the process of twisting the bed sheets and uve cover. Are you out of your mind? It's the fourth floor. If you fall and land, you won't stand a chance. Well, is going to prison better? Did they tell the truth? Did you set someone's apartment on fire and try to kill someone? Yes, Mom, yes, damn it. I set fire to that damned Marina's apartment along with that cursed Sonora Delgado. May they both be damned, along with the day I married that idiot. My son, Sonora Cortez, shocked, was left speechless. But why did you do it? I'd rather inherit the completely burned down apartment than have to spend my entire life with you. Mom, you never understood how suffocating your care can be for me. You never wanted to understand. But it's not just that. I need money. A starting capital that doesn't require me to toil for the rest of my life just to live decently in my old age. I would have sold that apartment and invested the money in a business or something else, I don't know. Or I could have lived modestly but for my own pleasure without those wretched 6 a.m. work shifts. But I never expected them to catch up with me. I was sure I had it all figured out. He was furious, feeling like a cornered beast. How, how could they have suspected that it was an arson? And most importantly, that it was me? Why, was spinning in his head. But it was too late to think now. He had to do something. What, he didn't know. Oh, my God. Sonora Cortez grabbed her head. She was shocked by what she had heard. For the first time in all these years, she realized what her son truly was, and it was a genuine nightmare for her. Leaving the room, she barely made it to the door, turned the key, and opened it. Armed men burst into the apartment and managed to grab Victor by the legs as he attempted to descend using the bedsheets. Six months later, Sonora Delgado survived, but her health deteriorated sharply after the fire. She could barely see could only move with assistance, and her burns never fully healed, leaving massive scars on her body. But she didn't complain. Sandra and Sonora Cortez helped her with groceries and paid her utility bills online while she spent her time on the balcony when she needed a gasp of fresh air. Sandra eventually made it to the hospital and met Victor's mother there. 
Realizing what her son had done, Sonora Cortez came to apologize, not to alleviate his fate, but because she sincerely regretted it. She never expected Victor to be capable of such actions, but, at the same time, admitted that she had raised him this way. She had accustomed him to an easy life, overestimating him. After their meeting, Sandra confessed to Sonora Cortez that she was expecting a child from Victor. It was the only joyful news amid all the chaos. In light of everything that had happened, Sandra promised to help her in any way she could. Her life's purpose now was her future Victor's son. Marina had left a will that initially prevented any disputes between the parties. She bequeathed the apartment and all the money left in her account at the time of her death to Sonora Delgado. It could have been different if the inheritance had been opened earlier than six months later, but by then, it was impossible to change anything. Victor was sentenced to 10 years of imprisonment in a high-security correctional facility. Sonora Cortez regularly visited him with packages. After all, he was her son. Despite never hearing any remorse from him, she still loved him. She was glad he was alive, sincerely glad. If she hadn't decided to inform the police back then, and if they hadn't managed to catch him by the legs in time, who knows what would have happened to him. This way, there was a chance that he would come to his senses, leave prison as a different person, and start a new life. Sonora Cortez believed in that. Since a neighbor had immediately called the firefighters, most of the apartment was saved from the fire. The neighboring apartments were also spared, so they only had to renovate the kitchen and part of the hallway. Before Sonora Delgado was discharged from the hospital, Sonora Cortez helped her with this. She hired workers who completed the renovation in just a few days. Sandra said she didn't know if she could ever forgive Victor. She wouldn't wait for him to be released from prison. If she met someone else, she wouldn't avoid relationships. She didn't believe that Victor would ever change. However, she wouldn't stand in Sonora Cortez's way when it came to her grandson. She had dreamt of it for so long, and she deserved happiness. Sandra believed that Sonora Cortez wasn't to blame for having a son like Victor and sincerely hoped that her own son wouldn't be like his father. If you're enjoying it as well, leave a like and subscribe to the channel.